Well, hello and welcome to the first ASP.NET Community Stand-Up of the Year. I'm very happy to have Olia with me. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so today Olia is going to be talking about tooling for modernizing .NET applications, which is exciting. Um, Yay. I, I just love seeing all the, the new tooling there. Like, I that's something I sneak into all my talks now. It's like, hey, you know, because we're always showing off all the brand new things in .NET. There's new .NET every year. There's amazing features yeah. in Azure. And then I'll talk to people, and they're using older versions, you know, and it's it's hard to keep up to date. And it's, it's great now to have good answers for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Also, All right. so many countries. Hi, guys. Hi to everyone. Thank you for posting where you're connecting from. It's super exciting for us to talk to you. It's amazing to me to see yeah. people joining from around the world and some of them up late at night. And it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing to be part of this like worldwide uh, group of friends build, all building on .NET. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I will start off with the community links for the week. So let me see. Here's what we got. The links are in a few places. So they are in the chat and they're also available here. Um, so I'll start going through them. Uh, first of all, if you missed anything from .NET Conf, uh, we did a, a roundup blog post on that. Um, and so that includes some of the, all the on-demand uh, recordings. So there's there's over 80 sessions um, and they're all linked in here. So there's a playlist there that has all of them. Um, and then top five sessions, some to call out here. Um, of course, the keynote was fun. Um, and then some of the you know top ones, the clean architecture session that Steve Smith did has been a big hit um, in the past and was again this year. Um, what's new in C Sharp 12, of course, was a big one. Here was one that surprised some people, but I wasn't surprised at all. What's new in web or in WinForms, right? And you know, there are a lot of people building apps on WinForms, and you can use great new features in, in .NET 8 with them. So yeah. I was I was excited by this. I thing. know Mary was very excited. She was watching the number of views for her talk, and she's like, "Have you seen those numbers? Oh my god!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was it was great. So, uh, you know, I I actually kind of talked her into doing the talk, and um, I was I was really happy <laughs> she did it. And I think we'll we'll be doing some more WinForms videos and and blog posts in the future. So, yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, hey, welcome C Sharp Fritz. Nice to see you there. Wow. Yep. Cool. All right. Let's go on. Oh, and then, uh, you know, of course, the Blazor session uh, was a big one. We had this new eShop app that we built out. Um, and uh, then, you know, we had a bunch of, there's still some local events going on around the world. So you can jump in on some of those. So anyways, I spent some time catching up over, over the holidays the past month on some of the videos. And I still have some more to go through. There's, there's a lot there. Yeah. Um, also, during December, there was a, uh, a new preview of .NET Aspire. So .NET Aspire uh, added a bunch of stuff. What I took away from this blog post, you know, some general kind of cleanup things, um, a lot more like in the dashboard specifically. There's a lot of, a lot of great advances in the dashboard. If uh, like Aspire does a lot of things, uh, making it easy to compose cloud native apps. Um, but if all it gave me was a dashboard, I feel like that's a big win to, to be able to see uh, what, you know, without doing any extra work to be able to see all my logs, all my launch URLs, you know, um, dig in on everything. So, yep. Uh, there was this huge post on .NET 8 networking improvements. I had not kept up with these, like there are so much in here. So um, a lot in metrics and observability um, there's so much in, you know, and telemetry and all that. There's additionally some things in configuring like HTTP client. Um, so, I mean, there's a huge amount here you can see from, from the, uh, scroll bar, but, um, if you, I don't know, I'm kind of a little overwhelmed by all that's in there, but I'm also really happy to see, you know, HTTP is such an important part of any modern .NET app and being and seeing all these updates is, is nice. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. Moving out to some general community things, just general news. Um, so 
Rick Strahl did a, a post on integrating OpenAI and Azure OpenAI into a .NET app. So here he has a, a cool app called Markdown Monster and a great you know, Markdown editor. And he wanted to include inserting uh, images from OpenAI. So, you know, nice in-depth blog post here where he walked through setting that up, uh, your different options using the OpenAI and the Azure OpenAI um, endpoints, pricing, just walk through of the whole thing. So, wow, that's amazing. I'm yeah. definitely going to read that. <laughs> yeah. I always love Rick Strahl's blog post. He goes into depth. He has, you know, all the code. Anytime I'm stuck on a problem and I find, I am going back decades, right? Anytime yeah. I find a problem yeah, and then yeah. I'll be like, Rick wrote a post. It's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, this was interesting here. So, Tyobi just announced uh, C Sharp was programming language of the year for 2023. So that wow. is exciting. Um, it's their formatting on their blog is a little funky, but one interesting thing is their their um, their way of of announcing who is the programming language. It's the the language that's gained the most in the past year. So C sharp is is not their top on their list, but it had the biggest jump over the past year. So that that's pretty neat and um, great to see the the interest there. Yeah. Um, okay, this was one that John Calloway sent in to me, and his uh, just kind of a neat project. This is RetroPie. It's a RetroPie uh, manager project in Blazor. So, uh, yeah, so RetroPie is a project for uh, gaming, retro gaming on a Raspberry Pi. And oh. yeah, and so I guess with that, you've got all these game you know, images from, from the cartridges and stuff, and you have to manage all those. And so he wrote a, a, a manager program for that. So nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another neat one. Uh, Christopher does tons of amazing stuff in Blazor. And here he wrote a Blazor wrapper for web authentication browser API. So the deal with this is browsers now have APIs for managing authentication, uh, including things like I've got a, a fingerprint uh, login on my on my computer, you know, and some have like a, a face scan or, you know, like different uh, uh, key pass or things like that. And browsers implement that. And so he, he's written kind of a wrapper around that. Mm -hmm. um, so here he's talking about like uh, touch ID, face ID, fingerprint, pin auth, etc. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, really cool. So um, here he wrote an app for this. And so like the one thing about this is I think when I hit, the problem is when I hit register, you're not going to see it because it actually pops up on my screen uh, um, a login thing. You know, it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OS, which is good, right? But yes, I, I actually... Yeah. I canceled out of it and here it shows the thing about the certificate. So pretty neat, um, pretty neat to see uh, a wrapper for that. So. Nice, nice. nice. Okay, so yeah. um, there is this billion row challenge. I don't know if you saw this. This is- um, I have not, no, wow. Okay, so what happened is in the Java world, um, here, let me put us over in the corner and give it a little more space. In the Java world, they announced this thing and the challenge is to go through a billion rows that have um, cities and temperatures. Okay. And you're supposed to total them up, give average temperatures or something. Oh, I see. So their challenge is how quick can you do this? Uh -huh. um, yeah, I think I've heard about it. Yeah. Okay. So uh -huh. for, for the original, they said this is Java only, but then other people are like, well, let's see yeah. how we can do on our platform. So here on... Um, on, oops, I switched the wrong screen. Here on .NET, you can see some pretty amazing results. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, that's very impressive. So this, it's, it's crazy to think going through a billion rows. Yeah. Um, and so Victor did a ton of work to get down to this 2.69, and then that that kicked Fred Krueger into gear, and he got it down to 2.68. <laughs> and when you oh, look wow. at 
when you look at the code, so I, I don't read F sharp all that well, but even the C sharp code, there's, I mean, there, there's some unsaved, there's memory map files, there's um, some, you know, pretty in-depth stuff, but just seeing the optimization in here uh, wow. is, is pretty slick, so. That is impressive, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the one last link I have to share is just this one from, from you. For and this is, uh, the announcement blog post for uh, Azure Migrate Application and Code Assessment Tool for .NET. Yeah, so, and about that one, we are gonna talk in more details today. So okay, yeah. so I'm I'm all done at this point. I'll turn I'll turn over to you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, very interesting news. I'm gonna check out some of those posts. Super interesting. And yeah. today, yeah. Can I share your screen yet? Um, sure. Or, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Today we, we are here. Is the desktop, but I'm going to pull up my Visual Studio in a few seconds. So we're going to talk about .NET uh, modernization tooling. So everything we have for you to make it easy to upgrade and update, modernize your .NET applications. And there are two main scenarios how people modernize their apps. It's uh, updating to the latest .NET, to the latest features, incorporating the latest C-sharp uh, APIs, .NET APIs, et cetera, et cetera. And also when they're moving their on-premises applications to Azure. Of course, there's also refactor your code, make it more cloud native, go to microservices, et cetera. We're not going to cover that one yet today because it's a very comprehensive topic, right? And a very hard task. But yeah. for first two scenarios, we have tooling for you. And today I would like to start with moving on premises to Azure because here we have a brand new tool that we just recently released with the .NET 8 .NET, uh, in November. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to share it with you. Okay. The tooling, yeah, is called Azure Migrate Application and Code Assessment, and it is available as a um, Visual Studio extension and also as a CLI, depending on what you prefer. First, I'm going to show you Visual Studio extension. So to get it in your Visual Studio, go to extensions and search for Azure Migrate, this one, Azure Migrate Application and Code Assessment and get that uh, VSX. I already have it on my machine. Once you install it on your Visual Studio, then you can open your ASP.NET application or solution in Solution Explorer, right click either or project or solution, and you will see this new option, replatform to Azure. If you don't see it, make sure you got the extension. Uh, and uh, once you click there, it will open the tool. Uh, short name is AppCat or Application and Code Assessment Tool. Uh, the first option, if you have already started working with it, you can save your work at any moment and then you can reopen it. So you go open report and here are some recent reports that I have. If you're just starting, click new report. Here you see the tree of your solution with all your projects and the tool pre-selects projects that would make sense to analyze for compatibility with the cloud. It's SP uh, applications and their dependencies, class libraries. So you can select and, select and select here anything you want. But if you selected a project and it has a dependencies on other like library in your solution, that library will be analyzed as well. So don't worry to make sure you took into account everything. The tool will help you here. So I made selection. I'm going to click next. Next option is you can analyze only source code and settings. So that's your code. You can also analyze binary dependencies. So if you, oh, <laughs> that was not pretty. But if you have um, dependencies on other NuGet packages, on other libraries, you can get analysis for that one as well. And that's a combination. You can check and check anything. If you check everything, your report will be much bigger. You'll get 
more issues, notifications, etc. So what I like to do, I like to get the report for my code separately because that's something I have control over. That's something I'm going to go ahead and change, fix, etc. But mm -hmm. also for my awareness, I like to have the report for binary dependencies. And for binary dependencies, sometimes upgrade into a different NuGet package or different version results them all. So for now, I will check source code and settings, go ahead, analyze, and now the tool is working. So here we have about 10 projects and the tool looks at every line, every setting, every configuration of my projects, and it um, assess if there will be any issues when I move to cloud. Those issues can be something that is not going to work or something that can be approved to make my application work more optimal in the cloud and so on. So you can see it's pretty fast. It took 11 seconds for 10 projects. If uh, I we tested it for very large projects and it still was able to complete in some very reasonable time. Okay. The first yeah. Well, some things, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. just to jump out, but some interesting things I noticed there, there's there's issues, incidents, and story points. Yeah, very good point. So um, issues, that's something that can be a problem. So for example, if I'm talking to a local database, that is an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, then incident, that that is occurrence of that issue in my code. So if in my code I have 10 calls to local database, it will be one issue, but 10 incidents of that issue. And we also added story points because that was an ask for, from our users. They wanted to see some estimation of how hard will it be to like mm -hmm. fix this file compared to that file or this project compared to that project. Of course, it's not going to translate into story points of your team because it, all teams are unique. But mm -hmm. if you see one project takes like three story points and another takes 500 story points, you can understand where the majority of your work will go to. And we evaluated like every incident. If it's trivial, it's one story point. If it's more uh, complicated work, three. If it's re-architect, it's more. You can also go here oh. and mm. it will give you more detailed information on like wow. because the story point value trivial complex redesign etc etc i also saw a question uh will it only suggest or will it also say full stop your dad <laughs> yeah uh what it's gonna do it's gonna suggest it's not gonna change anything in your code and that also when we talk to developers they prefer to be in charge of every changes when it comes to like azure and billing and like how much it will cost they prefer to have full control over their code but do give us feedback if you want some automated steps uh, we are actively working on this tool and we can make further changes Right now, it's going to give me information about what I need to change or what might be a problem, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Uh, all right. So uh, one other yeah. thing, I'm sorry, but one other thing that I love here is that export. And I'm guessing here, because a lot of time, like I might want to review this with my team or with my manager and and discuss, hey, this is, you know, I'd like to propose updating this project and here's what it's going to require. Right. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm gonna show the expert. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I see uh, questions in the chat. Thank you so much for being so engaged, and I'll try to answer them all. Is it like to do list? Uh, will it mark points to those to dos? Yes. I'm gonna show you. Uh, let Let's just go ahead, dive in. So before we move to to dos. Here, summary, we talked about that, then severity. So every issue has a severity. Mandatory is something that you absolutely have to fix. Otherwise, it will not work. Optional, that's something that you don't have to fix. But if you do, it will make your application more cloud native, more effective, 
faster, cheaper, etc. So that's something that we suggest. Potential that might or might not be a problem. We don't know. We cannot see it in your code. For example, if you're talking to some other service, we don't know if it's accessible from your cloud or not, but we're going to tell you, make sure it's accessible to something so you don't miss anything, but it might just work. And informational, that's just information points. And on the right-hand side, category, so it's grouped by SMTP, security, scale, local, etc. for convenience. Then we have a project view, and here I have all my projects and issues, incidents, story points for each. Here I can see I, I'm lucky to have two projects that are fully compatible, zero items here, they're ready. And I can zoom in, I can click to each project and have the same view, uh, same dashboard here. Oh, also in the dashboard, Let's go, let's pick more, eight at least. Dashboard, I can click to components view. And here I have a same distribution by files. Uh, I have issues, that's aggregated view per issue. So which issues are in my project? And then for each issue, similar view is here aggregated issues. So let's open, for example, I have cash or one issue. And uh, here is every instance of that issue that occurs in my code. So these are incidents. And very handy feature, I have a jump to the code so I can go and see where in my code it happens right away and start fixing it. I can also read what, what is happening here. So for example, for cash, your application is using a data cache. Some caching solutions will only work on the local machine or within an on-premise network. And it explains what might be the problem. It shows me where the source and every incident has more info. It opened here, but let me bring it here. So we always have a link to more information. Uh, it's documentation or a blog post that describes what the issue might be and how to fix it. Another thing here is a state, and that's more like going to to-do list. We have a state for each issue, each incident. You can also mark the whole file. Uh, you can change the state for file. And there is active, result, or not applicable. So when I'm working with a report, as I fix it, I can make my changes if there is like a potential issue and I checked and yeah, uh, I'm talking to endpoint, it's accessible from my new location. I can check it as not uh, applicable and all that state, current state, I can save. I can save into report, specify the path. Then I can share that report with my coworkers, with my manager, whoever, and they can start where I left. So we can work in the team together. Uh, we actually can uh, pause and look at the questions. And John, feel free if you want to read some questions out loud. Uh, yeah, to... well, so there was one that was saying, uh, let me see, trying to find, how's this done behind the scenes? Oh, yeah, that is a great question. So behind the scenes, we have the uh, engine that uh, takes uh, transformations and like rule analysis. It goes through it, looks at your code, and you can feed in the rules that we want to check. So the architecture can be extensible. And what is amazing, what I like about it, that you potentially can write your own checks that are applicable for your specific uh, company or organization. And you can also feed in those rules into the engine and it will analyze that as well. That's something that we also want to hear from you if that is uh, a feature that you would be interested in, if that would be helpful, if that's something that we should look into ways how to enable you with giving that access. But yeah, right now working with 
other teams, it's super easy for us to extend and add more and more rules that needs to be checked. When, and, when you yeah. mentioned that with working with other teams, a lot of projects that I see like this we also use internally at Microsoft. Like we have teams that are updating things. Do you have, are there some like internal teams at Microsoft that are also using this to update their application? Yes, absolutely. There are lots of, we are talking to a lot of uh, Microsoft teams and they're using it. Um, they're using this tool. They're also using a similar tool uh, that has similar architecture. It's uh -huh. called .NET Upgrade Assistant. Yeah, that one, that net upgrade assistant, the uh, initial purpose of the tool, and I'm going to show that as, oh, as cool. well, uh, yeah. is to upgrade to latest.net. But the architecture of the tool allows you to make any upgrades or any transitions. You can fit in any rules or transformations. And we're working with uh, a few Microsoft teams on helping them to transition from like one state of the project to another state of the project. And that can be extensible to even like switching from one test framework to another test framework or mm -hmm. from EF framework to EF core. Uh, it already has implementation for Azure functions, up updating Azure functions, older version to new version. Oh, wow. And so, on. so yeah, okay. we're working with lots of Microsoft teams and helping them with these two tools. They're are our better testers and contributors and yeah. The, you know, I've, I really like Upgrade Assistant. I've used it in some projects. I had forgotten that it works with functions and that's an area where upgrading functions can be a little painful. So yeah. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm encouraging you to check it out okay. and see, yeah, it's, it's supposed to upgrade everything to the latest version. There are a few options to what you can upgrade and yeah, and please give us feedback. Because okay. these tools are very young. This one uh, just have been released recently. So we're constantly working on improving it. If something is not working, and I, I'm asking for that every time I, I speak to developers, here, send feedback and uh, click I, I see record also, the problem, suggest um, a feature. Yeah. OK, I see also write. Um, let me see, a little bit down to the left from there, there's also a link that says leave feedback in the, yes. as a, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so cool. this one actually uh, soon, I will have a survey and I want ah. to connect the survey here. Right now it takes you to the same page okay. here. So it just describes how to report the issue. But if you report the issue there, especially if you mark it with AppCat or Azure Migrate, it will get forward to me sooner. It will end up in my task anyways. Okay. But if you mark it with the name of my tool, it will get straight to me and I read every single feedback. So yeah, I know like when I was not at Microsoft, I was always thinking like, no, there's no point of leaving feedback. Who's going to read it? Like I'm somewhere developer in Ukraine. Like, no, uh -huh. actually we read every feedback and it really helps us. So please, be active, engage with us, talk to us. That's how we know what to build for you guys. That's that's something any PM at Microsoft knows this deeply. Like any project I've ever worked on, including like a le learn tutorials or when I worked with Visual Studio for Mac or things, anytime you leave feedback, it goes to the PM, it goes on their task list, it gets brought up in meetings with managers about how many of these things we're, we're resolving and which are the top rated ones. So yeah, it's when the I always think of that when I'll see people complain maybe on social media, hey, there's a bug. Always report it because even if you've seen someone else report it, it adds to those yes. that thing, right? So yes. you'll get like this feature has been reported 10 times this month. It's high priority. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right because it also helps us to advocate for your opinion because when <laughs> When we're pushing for some feature, when we're asking for resources, uh, it's always a question like, is it like one person who encountered that problem or is it a hundred? And if we have those upvotes, we're like, look, there's so many people who face the same issue. We need to invest in that. Yeah. 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 And, and that's a common thing, right? Inside, we have limited, like any development team, we have limited resources and 
when we look at when we try and prioritize things, we think of, OK, we need to make these you know, version updates. We need to look at this uh, new feature and we have some bug fixes and being able to go in and, and say, hey, I need more development resources or we need to prioritize these bug fixes or customers really want this feature. You know, sometimes if we say I would like this feature, that's not as important as saying customers, you know, here are 10 yeah. customers that yeah. you know, they're being blocked by this. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I'm uh, scanning through the commands. Uh, Love Upgrade Planner. Yeah, that's another tool that I was planning to show you guys. And I'm happy you're already using it and loving it. Cool. Um, upgrade Assistant for migration from 4.8 to 8. Really easy. I'm very yeah. happy to hear that. Uh, yeah, if there are some questions about this tool, John, if I missed something and you see it, feel free to stop me right away. I would rather prioritize it to talk yeah. to people and answer the questions that they have. Yeah. Okay, so there's there's one here. Uh, so I don't, my understanding is this upgrade assistant would be more useful here. Would I be able to use the system to convert WPF project to a dev project solution, start working with hybrid Blazor? So not the uh, app Azure Migrate tool, uh, but potentially we can look like it's in theory can be done with Upgrade Assistant. I don't know how hard it will be and how like how many people actually need it. So that's the area that if there is enough crowd that really needs that functionality, that's something it's, it more goes into uh, the area of upgrade assistant so upgrades it's not uh, working yet of course but yeah keep uh, give us feedback let's see if there is enough people who needs that uh, everything is possible cool. awesome all right i'm gonna go back to this tool but feel free to stop and ask the questions if you see something Okay. All right. The other feature that I wanted to show you, export. So I can save the report in three different formats, HTML, JSON, and CSV. And you can ingest those reports. Then you can incorporate it with your other processes. So let me just, OK, I just saved it. And let me bring it here. I saved it as HTML report. And I have this pretty report that looks very similar to what I see in Visual Studio. I have dashboard, I have projects, I can, uh, it's uh, interactive, so I can click, I can go to different views, open it, etc. So that I've heard was very handy when people wanted to get some visual representation of the amount of work they need to do to mm -hmm. in order to move to cloud and take it to their management to other teams to present, they found it super helpful. So there's a related question on this, but I want to ask about this first. This is really nice. How is this built? Like this is a, a nice HTML. Is this, I, I'm just, as a developer, I'm interested in how, how you're building out this really nice report. Uh, so I'm not a developer. I have my engineering team. So I believe whatever they have the metadata, they save it into uh, JSON uh, HTML format. I cannot <laughs> give you more details, but <laughs> I definitely can ask my engineers and we can post it somewhere. If you have some channel of answering the questions that were not answered in the uh, live streaming, we can yeah. post the answer there. Yeah, people, you can leave comments, on, um, especially uh, in YouTube, It'll the, those will show up there. And Perfect. this, is, this yeah. is kind of related. I, I know it's, this is not Azure AppCat, you know, specific, but I do get this question about what, what do we recommend for people? For crystal for, reports. Crystal reports, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So I do not know about offerings in SP world. And I don't know, John, maybe you have well, any ideas? 
so what I recommend to people from Microsoft solutions, there's like Power BI, I think is kind of the yes. main thing we point people to. And then the community does have some good, um, you know, they're paid solutions, but there are um, some paid offerings out there. Crystal Reports wasn't a free product either, right? So um, yeah. there's other uh, right, um, yeah. from community or from the, you know, in the, I don't know, ecosystem that you, that you can buy, but so, yeah. yeah. And but from Microsoft, I always say Power BI. Yeah, that's pretty good. For WinForms, also Power BI for the latest and greatest and extremely comprehensive analysis of the data. And mm -hmm. we also brought the chart control back because a lot of people were using it. When we oh, nice. first moved to Core, uh, it wasn't there and uh, people were like, we want this <laughs> and yeah. we brought it. <laughs> Um, so, there's but, there's yeah. a couple more questions that just came in, or um, so one thing. This is just feedback. Uh, need more feedback on progress. It seems to be s just sitting there, running for over five minutes. Okay, that means something is wrong, probably. Um, okay. Unless your application is really big, it should. It always took us. No, may, maybe if your application is really really big, let it be. But if it doesn't complete, please file the issue that is an issue and we will fix it. So that would be super helpful if you file the issue. And one other thing about this I forgot to mention earlier, if you do report feedback, a lot of the time that'll help capture debugging information we can use, like if you report exactly. a problem. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's why we prefer it through Visual Studio because then we get all the logs and it's much easier for, for us to reproduce the issue. Okay. Yeah, yeah here's uh, someone else. Mine stopped too. I closed the report and ran it again, and it was very fast. So, okay, yeah. So. Um, yeah. Let me see. Uh, question here. Can this tool be used in the future to calculate resources and pricing estimates for Azure based on the services being used by the application itself? Great question as well. We have a different tool for that. And okay. Called Azure Migrate, okay. and that is a portal. So check out that one. That one gives you overall picture of all your services, all your databases, and the price estimate for everything. Okay. So yeah, if you want to assess in general, what will it look like to move all your code or parts of your code to Azure, and you want to plan that whole thing, Azure Migrate is a great offering for that. And when you are actually, like when developers are tasked uh, to take the app and make it work in the cloud, that's mm -hmm. this tool, uh, code assessment, AppCat. Is it is it easy to show that Azure Migrate quickly or I, I'm putting you on the spot? Fortunately, <laughs> I don't have it on okay. my machine, but I will look for presentations and links and I'll share it with you. Okay. Because so. that also, I think that deserves like a separate prime yeah. time. <laughs> and yeah, we can we can invite some uh, PMs to present it and go into all details because there are like lots of pages, lots of uh, things you can look at and assess, et cetera. And I just don't want to give the wrong impression of yeah. <laughs> that tool okay. because my knowledge is much smaller than the tool. Okay. Sounds good. I think that's all the main questions at this point. Perfect. Okay. Then another thing I wanted to share regarding this tool that there is also CLI. And to get CLI, it's a .NET global tool. So to install it, you simply run .NET tool install uh, global .NET AppCat. And once you install it, then you can run AppCat, analyze, and pass to your solution. Let me run it here so you can see the experience. Very similar. Uh, it's going to ask me a few questions. So do I want to analyze source code? Do I want to analyze binary dependencies? I can check and check everything. Then uh, next question, what format for the report? CSV, HTML, JSON. Let's do CSV for now. Report name. Let's do report. From you need to stand up. Oh, it's OK. And um, OK, the tool is ready. It's asking me if I am ready. I am ready. We are running the tool. 
So in comparison with Visual Studio, this runs slightly longer because uh, in Visual Studio, we already have certain things uploaded and uh, here we need to run additional steps, but not by much. It's just something that if you observe it, that yeah, that's what happens. And this tool, oh, another thing that I wanted to say, why many people like CLI because they can automate the run of mm -hmm. these uh, commands into their uh, scripts. And you can do that too. Here I was answering some questions, but you can feed that as a parameters and just okay. do it with one line. And then you do not need a person in front of the screen. Wow, All right. Nice. So, yeah. Here, Similar thing, we have mandatory, optional, potential, informational, zero. Uh, and uh, the report has been saved. Let me find this report right now. And that one is a CSV report. So um, here, this is how a CSV looks like. It's issues, uh, description, state, uh, severity, the pass, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that is a report in CSV format. Of course, in um, uh, from the CLI, you can save it as HTML and get that nice visual view as we had in Visual Studio. So, question: yeah. Since this is a global tool, does it run on uh, non-Windows machines, or is this? Uh, you need uh, .NET SDK for that. Okay, so I could I could run it on another OS as long as I had the .NET SDK. I need to check that. Okay, <laughs> so I I'm that. Curious because sometimes that's a re you know because Visual Studio is awesome. It's also Windows right. only, and so if I have an application I'm developing on Mac or Linux, um, yeah, yeah. Or I'd be curious too if I could automate it on my CI build or something too. Yeah, uh, I'll check that one. For okay. the VSX, obviously you need Visual Studio, yeah. but for this one, uh, I believe all you need is SDK. .NET nice. SDK. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that was a .NET AppCat or Azure Migrate Application and Code Assessment tool. And yeah, please give us feedback. Use it. Let us know. We're still working on it, so you can influence the direction of our work. Please do. And uh, yeah, we have a few, uh, a little more time. I wanted to show again .NET Upgrade Assistant and .NET Upgrade Planner. What do you think, John? Awesome, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So because we've talked about those tools in different community stand-ups and it was around for some time, but there's still people who have not heard about it. And mm -hmm. I think that's a great tool to use. So first, .NET Upgrade Planner. That uh, tool is great if you have a large application and you want to get the initial like understanding on what is compatible, what is not compatible with the target framework that I want to upgrade to, how much work will it take, where this work will be. So to get the tool, we are going to APIs of .NET and here .NET Upgrade Planner. And you do download beta and it might, so this tool is done by one of our uh, uh, team members. We have not productized it yet. So sometimes you can get notifications that like, do you trust this tool? Are you sure you can trust this tool? Once you have it, I'm going to call it .NET Upgrade Planner here. And a uh, few options here. The first one, open project. Uh, it's a minor confusion point. It's not a .NET project. It's a project of .NET Upgrade Planner. So if you have mm -hmm. started working with it, you can save the state. And that would be your project. And then you can reopen it because I was confused myself. I was going yeah. for the first button. Uh, now, if that's the first time that I am using the tool, I do either select files or select folder. Let me select folder. And the first time it gets my code. And again, it does the analysis. It pulls up the .NET 
APIs, the .NET frameworks, the description of every API in every .NET uh, framework. Or, and it assesses my code uh, in terms of compatibility for, with those. So first time takes some time, then it's super fast. And here I can see I have my project. I have all the dependencies in the form of the graph. I can like look through it. The red one means uh, it, this one has some issues. Yellow has some warnings, information. And the gray means that uh, it seems it's compatible, but uh, you all, always need to build it to know that there are no build errors. And you can double click on the node, see the graph just for that node, or double click go back. What I like doing here, so here, if we look at assembly uh, list, all the assemblies, there's lots of dependencies, right? There's like mm -hmm. Microsoft Owen, Microsoft AI. So to look at just my code, I'm going to select everything else and just delete it. And now I can see just my code, just my application. There are three projects. And again, for uh, dependencies, the easiest way that I would recommend is see if there is a newer version of the NuGet package or the library that you're using. Mm -hmm. Very often, there is one compatible with .NET Core, .NET 5, .NET 6, .NET 8, etc. Just upgrade it and all your problems will be resolved. Okay. So here, uh, current framework, .NET 4.8. Desired framework, automatically it sets it to .NET 8, but I can choose any. I can go set desired framework and choose whatever I want to upgrade to. And there are also options, .NET 8, Android, iOS, Mac OS, et cetera. So, if I know exactly the platform, I can limit it to that. Then uh, desired platform, right now it's any, I can choose, uh, I can, for example, if I know that I'm not working on Android or I'm working only on Windows, I can choose that. And that might resolve some compatibility things because like, for example, I have a purely Windows application, but I'm getting some issues that it's not uh, compatible with Android. Well, in my case, I don't care. I just set yeah. Windows. I got it clean. Portability score and number of problems. And on the right-hand side, you can see the description of the problem. So API missing. These are the APIs that are missing. Uh, there's some information, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the Net Upgrade Planner. This tool is or large comprehensive upgrades. If you first want to see the compatibility, maybe talk to your teammates, coworkers, define the strategy. If you're taking different dependencies, if you're re-architecting something, et cetera, et cetera. For smaller apps, or if you're feeling lucky, you can go ahead and just use .NET Upgrade Assistant. And for that one, let me close this solution, open a different one. So the tool that actually upgrades to the latest .NET is called .NET Upgrade Assistant. It also it is also available as a Visual Studio extension as well as CLI, very similar to um, AppCat. So here is the tool .NET Upgrade Assistant. To get it on my VS, I simply type in .NET Upgrade Assistant, get it installed, and once I have it. Then I have this option, right click on the project and upgrade. So that one will call .NET Upgrade Assistant. For Upgrade Assistant, currently we have implementation only for project level. So if you right click on solution, you will not see that option. But that's something that we have heard people would like to have. And we are thinking about adding that in future. Okay. But yeah, keep in mind, upgrade assistant, right click on the project, not solution. This is upgrade so, assistant. Yeah. So sorry, but 
Yeah. What's so the list of things you can update? Like, um, mm, you can do question. web apps. You can do um, desktop. I've done I've done demos with like old WinForms apps. Like yes. from um, you can do in and web apps. You can also um, correct me when I get it wrong here, but you can also do. Um, like .NET Framework, so even like web forms applications you can upgrade, right? And then it uses the... No. Yeah. Actually, web forms is the only type that you cannot upgrade because we don't really have a substitution for web forms or like we don't have web forms implementation in the latest .NET. And there might be something that we can do, but we have not implemented it in Upgrade Assistant yet. So, so yes. I guess the tool doesn't do it, but I have talked to people. Yeah. You can you can use the um, I'm drawing a blank now on the proxy thing. Uh, YARP. You can still use YARP with web forms to slowly yes. migrate pages over. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Uh, okay. We do not have implementation because we don't have like a clear path. We didn't okay. bring web forms to .NET eight, and okay. we don't have a like a yeah clear recommendation so we have not automated that pass yet but okay. that's pretty much the only type of the app that is not supported by upgrade assistant wow. unfortunately okay. silver light as well because silver light is in the past but everything else is and that is winforms wpf uh console uh class library uh we can even port dot net um Sorry, we can port Xamarin Forms to Maui. Oh, right, right. Yeah. You can use the tool. Uh, you soon will be able to use the tool to port WCF applications to WCF core. And yeah. uh, that is just the implementation that we need to add. We have a prototype in the older version of CLI, but we need to bring it to this um, tool. And yeah, all ASP.NET, MVC. Um, so, yeah, yeah, here's a question. Can you update MVC 2.0 to 7.0? And yes. Yeah, you can, which is yeah. crazy. Yeah, you <laughs> can. And it also supports all versions of .NET. So no matter how old your .NET is, it can be .NET Framework 1, and it will update it to the latest .NET. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so here, upgrade projects to a newer .NET version. That's what we were talking about. We also have another option, upgrade project features. And that's what, when I was talking about working with other teams on upgrading something to something, that mm -hmm. functionality will go here. Currently, we have here on the convert project to SDK style. So if you know all .NET framework projects, they have that project file, a very complicated, huge project file. Actually, mm -hmm. I probably can show it here. Let me see. Uh, yeah, it's an old framework. So if I unload this one and then, yeah, this is the old project file, very large one. And uh, the .NET Core family has the new project file, it's called SDK style project file, which is much smaller, much better looking. Um, let me, uh, so reload that, yeah, reload. Uh, we've heard the feedback that some people wanted to just that upgrade separately from upgrading.net. So we added it. If you have anything else that you want to uh, upgrade just that, that, potentially will go here. But for today, let's look at .NET version upgrade. So I choose the first option. And here are a few options. Uh, these are types of upgrades. So there are three. In place means that it's just going to take my code and upgrade it to latest .NET. Side by side, we'll create a copy of my project, will not touch my project and just upgrade that copy. And some people prefer that, that really depends, like source control helps you work with these things, but some people still prefer to have just a copy and the fully working application not touched. <laughs> and there is another option side-by-side -side incremental. 
And that one is great for web applications because for the transition from uh, ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core is um, one of the hardest. And so it's much easier to upgrade WinForms or WPF application because ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core are very different platforms, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, you probably know it better than me, but <laughs> for yeah, this one, <laughs> yeah. What we've heard talking to developers is the, was that um, when they're upgrading their SP applications, it might take a lot of time. And what they prefer to do, they prefer to do it um, incrementally, but they really don't like to have their whole application broken when they're going through upgrade phase. And that's why we created this type of upgrades, incremental, that allows you to have fully working application while you're upgrading. And I'm gonna show you this one. Uh, let me scan through questions. John also helped me with questions. If you see anything that yeah, we should well, address right away. Um, there's discussions about like silver light yes. applications. Yeah. That, um, that, I mean, that's a bigger deal, but yeah, I would, you know, people, um, there are some projects out there like open silver. So that's an option. Yeah. Uh, somebody's saying another missing thing that they're, that they're missing is SQL projects. Um, oh, uh, upgrading SQL projects to. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the the newer. That uh, you know. that is something that we can do. So if if there is a, enough demand, that definitely can come here. So cool. Post the feedback somewhere, please, so I can mm -hmm. take it <laughs> to my manager and advocate for <laughs> these features. All right. Uh, another thing that. Uh, this upgrade assistant will pick the uh, upgrade types that are best for your application. So for example, before I clicked on the class library and I had all those options, right now I right clicked on my MVC project and here just side by side incremental because we believe that that is the best for web. And um, if you have WinForms, you won't have incremental, you just have in place or side by side. The so next step, a new project or existing project. If you have started migration already manually, you can choose existing project. In my case, I'm choosing new one and I'm going to upgrade to net eight. On it. Um, let me just do something one because I already did it before the show. On the next screen, there are options of .NET. Were frameworks. So .NET 8 supported until November 2026, long-term version. That is the version that we recommend. This is the one that you should go for. <laughs> There's also an option .NET 7. It's a standard term support. They always show the latest LTS, long-term support, the latest STS. And we also added here .NET 6 because some people were in the process of migration to .NET 6, that is older LTS, when the .NET uh, new version came out. And we, we received the feedback that like, I upgraded half of my projects to .NET 6, uh, and now .NET 6 is replaced by .NET 8. Give me .NET 6 back. So we yeah. gave it back. <laughs> that <laughs> okay. was actually a, a great story where like we chatted through that feedback visual studio feedback channel to yeah. a person who complained and within a day we were able to like make a decision ask my engineers to implement it and probably in two or three days we had it in production that wow. feature yeah so Yes, please talk to us. If some, if we broke you accidentally, let us know. <laughs> We're happy to fix it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to choose .NET 8. And now it talks me through the things that it's going to do. And what it's going to do, it's going to create a YARP proxy server. It's going to create a new .NET 8 uh, ASP.NET Core app. And you know, right, ASP.NET Core, that's the platform, but it, it can target .NET 8, mm -hmm. the, the naming thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So here is my new project. Uh, 
And right now we can see it's pretty empty because this is the original one. There is a lot of stuff in it. And then this one is basically like hello world sp.net mm -hmm. core project. It targets .NET 8. But what is amazing that uh, this one is a facade for my older project. So if I run the application, it's going to write run my .NET 8. But then when I'm doing calls to my project, it's going to verify if that route is implemented in the new project. And if not, it's going to forward it to the old framework application. So that yeah. way, I have not ported any like model view, any classes yet, but I already have the app running and there's like smooth work in production. Now I can take controller by controller and slowly port it at my own speed without breaking the whole application. And let me show you um to do that so i love that yeah. being able to do because w in case people didn't pick up on that like so yeah this is using yarp can you open in the core project open program cs yeah absolutely because that i think that is the um yeah the pr exactly this here so basically this is the magic is now you've got this dotnet core front end and it mm -hmm. has that map forwarded on line, on line uh, 23 and 24, where it's basically like, hey, if if I can't handle anything, just send it all back to the original yeah. .NET Framework app, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So then you just go through one by one and just migrate your stuff over. And and this is the, the magic thing here is that, like you were saying, people when we would talk to people about here's how to migrate your application or rewrite your application, it was really hard to, because it'll take months or years yes. to update an app. Yeah. Right. And so this yeah. lets you run both side by side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And now uh, if I go like same right click upgrade, I can see the summary. So I have .NET framework with 20 endpoints and .NET, .NET 8, with zero endpoints. So everything is on framework right now, but I have them both working together. And now I can uh, also, we can look at Endpoint Explorer. Here are all my endpoints, nothing in the new project yet. So we can take, like say, upgrade controller and choose a controller here and click upgrade. It will upgrade controller as well as dependencies for that. So I can see some views here that the controller um, works with. And I'm going to click upgrade. And upgrade assistant will upgrade that controller with its dependencies. So here I can see the field green check mark means that we made changes. We, we've done some changes to this file and it's all good there is also this like not field green check mark that one means that it was already compatible we haven't touched it it just works and there is also some information and if there are some issues you will see an error but yeah for information you can read package microsoft oven does not support target framework but there's probably a version of Owen that supports it. So I just need to upgrade my NuGet packages and that should be done. And now when I go to Endpoint Explorer, I already have these three endpoints implemented here. Wow. And if I go to summary, I should have, yeah, three endpoints on .NET, 17 on .NET Framework. So when I run this application right now, if I call one of those three endpoints, it's going to execute the new project. If I'm going to call everything else, it's going to reroute it to .NET Framework project. Okay. And that's how you uh, port web application incrementally. So one by one, you're moving pieces until everything is in the new pro in the new .NET 8 or .NET the latest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we are about at time. 
We but, are, yeah, this, but, but this is great. And it's always good to see updates on Upgrade Assistant. And we do have, for people that are, this is new to, we've also done some shows. Um, we did one with Taylor Southwick on uh, system web adapters. Yeah. Yes. That helps solve the hard problems, right? Because as you, as you're like needing to share state or cookies or authentication, some of those trickier things. So this one is using web adapters inside it. Nice. Yes. So when you are uh, running initially, it adds the uh, reference to system web adapters and it is using that. Yeah, that's wow. that's a great package. Okay. Very handy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess one one final thing just to, in closing is we should remind people where to um, or point people at the blog post, I guess. We Absolutely. Yes. Know. So, um, yeah, let me bring this. Uh, if, ah. if you use this one, this one is not a blog post. That's a documentation for okay. AppCat for porting to um, Azure. And let me just bring the browser and... That that's the one. Uh, so documentation for .NET upgrade, um, .NET Azure migrate, and there's installation, Visual Studio walkthrough with like step by step. Click one, two, three. That's how you use it. CLI walkthrough how to use that, and how to interpret results, like all those things. For .NET upgrade assistant, that is. AKA, um, let me zoom in so you have it. .NET UA. This one, .NET UA Upgrade Assistant. And that brings you to the website for .NET Upgrade Assistant, where you can watch a video how to use it. There's upgrade in Visual Studio, also upgrade in CLI. Everything leads you to the documentation or installation links. Uh, the support, that's the types that are supported. Yeah. And yeah. Awesome. Mate. Pretty much cool. these so two. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank all you right. so much. It was great talking to you. Thank you for being so involved and posting all the questions and commands. It's very exciting to see, hear the feedback. You guys yeah. are amazing audience. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. All the all the um, feedback. People are very excited about this, and um, so I, and please let me know if the, is there new updates. Uh, you know, Absolutely. remind me, and we'll, we'll get you back on, and we'll show. The yes, updates. actually, a new version is coming in the first week of February for oh, wow. app, uh, for AppCat for Azure Migrate Story, and that okay. one will be infused with AI. Oh my goodness! Oh, yes, all right, <laughs> AI is everywhere. I'll yes, I didn't see that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, quickly answering, there's no VS Code extension for that one. It's only Visual Studio or CLI. Okay. Okay. But Upgrade Assistant, I know for a fact you can use on uh, not Windows machines. And there was a big um, crowd of Xamarin forms folks yeah. who wanted to use that upgrade on non-Windows machines. So it works for Maui. Upgrading from Xamarin forms to Maui, you can do it on uh, any machine, awesome. as long as you have .NET SDK. Yeah. OK. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'll, I'll uh, play us out with the music. So thanks, Yay. everyone. Thanks, okay. everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day or night. <laughs> OK. Bye. Bye.